hiring your first AE, some would say you've gone a little early. Some founders like to get as close to the million mark as they can before bringing in someone else. What was your decision making behind hiring an AE much earlier than the norm? Yeah. So I'd gotten 2% of the way there. I think that there are merits to both approaches. I think that there is a lot of wisdom in founder-led sales get all the way to a million because that's probably where you start to see replicability. I think one of the worst traps that uh, a founder can have is say, I need a CRO or I need a CMO. And both of those traps are, you actually need like a better founder. And by the way, I will say a short percent of the journey in, I copped out and said, we could really use an AE to drive processes. And the fact was, this person was just objectively better than I was at driving the process through at understanding, I would say sales jargon and sales best practices. And I think that there's a lot of wisdom in the wait to a million, because that way you can create the process that person can then scale up and implement. Whereas if you're doing it early like we did, you probably don't have a repeatable process. That might be a repeatable lead source, top of funnel. It might be a repeatable motion or repeat, like a sort of repeatable sort of problem that you're solving. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Tech Salecast with me, your host, James Hounslow. And today I'm delighted to be joined by another early stage founder to come and share uh, their early stage journey. And today we've got Peter Fishman on the show. Peter, how are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So you are CEO and co-founder of a business called Mozart Data. Um, uh, and we're going to hear all about that um, during this episode. But as a way of getting started, Peter, if you could just give our audience a, a brief background as to uh, as to who you are. Sure. Um, so I'm Peter Fishman. I go by Fish. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Mozart Data. Um, we're a data infrastructure as a service platform. Um, we help SMBs uh, succeed with their data. But my personal background is having worked as data analyst, data scientist, um, and data platform leader. So I have sort of held all of the data roles at mostly early and late stage companies um, for the past uh, 15 or 20 years. Interesting. Um, so let's go back to, to, to where I started. How did you find your way into data? Sure. So um, I, uh, I went I, like many people in data, was sort of like a failed academic. So I did a PhD um, and uh, I did a PhD in, in in the Bay Area and ended up really falling in love with this place. And um, in order to stay in the Bay Area, you had to pretty much work in tech. And I um, ended up sort of finding a role with a tech company that was really trying to be um, a little bit data centric, data forward. And um, that turned sort of all my academic skills into sort of practical um, in the field B2C analytics skills. So that transition was pretty easy. Um, the statistical softwares were different, the, um, but the thinking was very similar. Um, and, you know, instead of writing papers and you'd work for, you know, days or weeks or months or even years on getting the standard errors right, we would be shipping experiments and finding out results by the you know, end of the hour. So, um, so it, it, there was a little bit of a mindset shift, but at the end of the day, it was a pretty natural transition from doing data in my life as an academic to doing data um, at a tech company. Love it. Um, and had you always wanted to start your own business, or was this something that grew during your 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 love for for data and tech? Sure. Well, um, I, I, of the founding team, Dan is really the entrepreneur. Um, I have traditionally been at early stage companies. So I've loved the sort of hustle and bustle of startups, um, the growth, um, the growth of not just the company, but typically the people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do have a real love for startups and sort of uh, making sort of a market and impact. Um, I would say the entrepreneurial bug sort of caught me a little bit late. So Dan and I started this company in our forties, which was really yeah. my first tech entrepreneurial endeavor. Um, I actually, Dan and I previously, uh, 10 years earlier had started a hot sauce company together. So that was a sort oh. of side hustle. Um, 
that ended up being sort of a real business. But uh, for the most part, uh, my entrepreneurial bug, I think it's sort of always there. I think the point of tech is you sort of almost work your way down. Yeah. So I like to say, you know, uh, it, you know, the sort of traditional world is you work your way up the ladder. In tech, you work your way down the ladder. How can I be a contributor to a two hundred thousand person company like Microsoft, where I where I worked? Um, how can I be a contributor to a two thousand person company? How can I be a contributor to a two hundred person company, to a twenty person company, and then to a two person company? So you sort of almost work your way down the ladder, um, and eventually, you know, my you know my hope was to end up as an entrepreneur. Um, you know, it is sort of the biggest professional highs and lows all wrapped into one. Yeah, love that. So how did uh, Mozart Data come about? I always love hearing um, the, the conversations around how the idea came about um, and how you how you made it a reality. Sure. I mean, I just I wish it were more clever. Uh, Dan and I had been bouncing around uh, uh, startups, mostly implementing the same stack, yeah. centralizing all the data in a data warehouse and um, then sort of cleaning up the data into reasonable uh, into a reasonable data model. And um, we ultimately said, you know, we had worked at companies that could afford this, but it had big impact on these companies. So I worked, you know, typically the biggest companies in the world can easily afford these types of teams and these types of infrastructure. Um, but the smallest companies in the world obviously can't and also don't really have the data or scale to do it. Um, and we worked at generally wealthy startups. So startups who were, you know, well venture funded that knew that there was a lot of value in this. We saw that that value would get created and that teams would not only see the value, they would start investing tons of resources towards it um, in an inefficient way. Um, you know, I, at when I worked at Yammer, had a large team devoted to building out a data platform that built effectively uh, a tool like Mozart. So, uh, we realized that there was a lot of value that gets unlocked in the uh, data infra world that typically um, was a barrier to many of uh, the really best operators at companies that couldn't afford it, um, using their data really effectively to grow their business and even their own careers. Yeah, love that. Um, so what it is though is that you, you you start a business based on the fact that you see a critical need um in other businesses and thinking right how do i take this uh to other businesses that will definitely need uh the uh, the same work and make it more affordable um so how do you do that so when did you start from when you started when did you first start showing clients what you had so there's a a reed hoffman quote that that we really like and i'm going to butcher the quote but it goes something along the lines of like if you're proud of your first product uh you've shipped too late i don't think that that's the exact quote but it's very close yeah. and um uh, dan and i did uh y combinator as uh as a very early company so um shortly after starting the company um we did the next batch of of yc um after getting in off the wait list. And uh, we ended up um, really aggressively pushing our product to other YC founders, mostly in our batch. Um, and there were many moments of embarrassment in terms of, um, in terms of the product not fully working. And for the most part, uh, the product had some like mechanical Turk components where you, know, you would interact with, with a website thinking that it's a website, but you're actually interacting with Dan, who yeah. would then essentially execute the commands uh, yeah. that 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 you were asking Mozart to do. Um, of course, we've grown up since then, but I think um, I think we, we definitely take a lot of pride in uh, just a few, you know, a few months after starting the company, we had a real working product for people. Um, even if most of that product was ourselves doing things. Yeah. Um, so I think that uh, now, you know, today, you know, to have, to have our customer scale, it's, it is not just Dan in a back room going crazy. Yeah. Um, but ultimately uh, I think that that's a great practice for mm -hmm. starting uh, a company, which is if, you know, uh, you know, it's sort of just a, a YC trope, but it is, it is a good one, which is do things that don't scale. So, uh, you know, start off by doing something that 
uh, you know, you know, sort of prove out your your fit. And actually, our initial product very much was sort of going in the wrong direction. So it wasn't, you know, what people were wanting or asking for. Um, it was a slice of sort of Mozart data that we found to be really important that we have actually incorporated into the product very much since, but it wasn't sort of the core thing that was driving them to get a lot of value or the thing that they needed most at first. So um, so there was some learnings there and that's sort of an approach that I, I would wholeheartedly get behind. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna bring on to that. Um uh what were some of the key learns you had by talking to clients so early on and running it that has helped shape you to who you are today that if you'd held on a bit longer that you might have missed. I, I think the number one thing that entrepreneurs uh struggle with or need to learn or need to learn the hard way, need to learn as a lesson, not as sort of an easy lesson. Um, there is a classic quote, um, I, I, you know, and again, I'm going to mess it up. It's a Henry Ford quote, which is, if I asked my customers what they want, they would say faster horses. Yeah. And this quote is very much overused in, in technology, um, mostly because um, it's a good excuse not to listen to your customers. It's yeah. a good, ex and, and, and I very much believe the exact opposite. So, um, one of the, you know, as as you said, where did where did Mozart come from? Yeah. Well, it came from Dan and I doing this work at different companies, um, but ultimately this work, and we saw it have a huge impact. So our mind then went to, well, we know this is incredibly valuable for you. You're going to find this incredibly valuable in, you know, one, three, six, 12, 24 months. We know it. So you should trust us, you're going to get a lot of value out of this in, in, you know, in, in just a, a short while, trust us. That really doesn't work. And that often sort of steers people in the wrong direction. You do need to deeply understand what is the customer problem and what is it that the customer wants? What is the customer will pay for? Um, I think too often uh, we ourselves have fallen into the trap of this was a really valuable product. So, you know, sub product at, our past company, therefore we should build it as opposed to soliciting something that a customer really, you know, wants solved that they're willing to pay for. So I think that um, there is this tension between sort of a vision of you sort of know what works. Now it might not work in a go forward way. It might've been very helpful, you know, 10 years ago in a way that it's not needed today. Um, or it might've worked in the specific context that you had it. Uh, but I think the sort of, you know, and then and then there are certainly examples like Henry Ford where actually it it does work. You actually do need to sort of build to a future that maybe a big uh, you know a big chunk of your customer base can't imagine. So there is this reasonable tension. Um, I would just default to the to the latter side of 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 trusting your customers. And for the most part, for us in our story, that's been shrinking the time to value. So we have this tension, which is: Do you try to get somebody to value and an insight? really, really, really quickly? Or do you try to give them a platform that's going to be really, really helpful to them as they sort of continue their data journey? Well, of course, the answer is both. Um, but where we found sort of our customer interactions to lead us is to the most valuable features in the second part, not all of the features, but the most valuable ones. And of course, you know, there's a strong bias towards the first because the prospects are trying to solve a real issue that 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 needs scratching. Love it. Um, so that kind of leads me on nicely to um, uh, a question I always like to to ask. You come from a, a background of um, tech, data, super intelligence. How did you find putting on a sales hat and going out and 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 trying to sell what you were building? So. Uh... Dan and I are both technical founders, um, as well as sort of John, the the first employee who joined just also uh, uh, the first month of the company. So somebody has to uh, bear the sort of torch of a uh, salesperson at the company. Yeah. And um, and that 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 was me. So I was our head of sales. Some founding teams have a very natural split. Person A is the 
you know, founding revenue person and person B is the founding technologist. And, um, and that sort of, you know, you have a peanut butter and jelly type combination. Um, but other teams, there's sort of more of an overlap of skills. So, you know, Dan and I both have worked um, mostly in technical departments for our entire careers. Um, the, the answer is uh, neither of us is particularly good at it uh, for, for, for obvious reasons. And it is quite humbling um, in a variety of ways. And, um, you know, some of the outreach is very unnatural to me um, and is quite a challenge. So it's it certainly made me respect the profession um, in ways that are just, uh, you know, it's incredible. It's just, it's incredible what sort of determination um, and sort of um, like there's a real mindset to being to being that sort of meticulous and that uh, productive and that sort of, you know, have that have that sort of ability to hit cadences and and, and do a variety of things and get creative. It's it's sort of a, a whole different set of skills that, that, you know, versus, you know, I think there's a lot of creativity and a lot of um, focus that is needed in the data space. Um, but that said, it's a very different kind of using of the brain. Um, I will say it wasn't my first first time in sales, so uh, I, I like I do like to tell a story that when I worked at Zenefits, um, we had a day where the executives all had to function as SDRs um, oh, wow. for a morning, and I came into that morning telling all the I I used to sit next to the SDR team, I was high fiving them on the way in. I'm gonna be like, you know, by nine oh three, I'm gonna have booked my first demo. You know, I, sort of doing this whole bit, and uh, and what I deeply remember is I I could not have been more confident. And then you know I had had my list, and I you know started the process, and uh, I I make my my first uh, my first cold call, and uh, everything's fine. I'm punching in the numbers. It's great. I uh, I have the phone, and then it starts ringing, and then I you know I sort of seize up and get, get a little nervous, and of course I get an answering machine. But I was too nervous, and I, I just like hug up the answering machine, and and ultimately while I did get better over the hour, I had a mental model that you know by nine oh one nine oh two I would have booked my first demo, and then in practice it actually took me the whole day <laughs> even just to to book a demo of a free call of a free product. So. I, I will tell you that um, I do have a lot of respect for that function. I've obviously had to play that function. Um, reasonably early in the company's life, we did hire uh, a salesperson, and um, he's been an incredible uh, AE in, in a past life and now an AE leader. Um, but uh, I, I will say that I am the person that got Mozart from uh, zero to twenty four thousand dollars of ARR, and then uh, and then he he is the person that so so I you know very often we talk about like a you know an X million. Well, I you know I got to point oh two four uh, uh, so zero to point oh two four um, is is kind of um, is kind of uh, my claim to fame. I like it. So so two parts questions on that. Um, what advice would you give to other technical founders um, about selling and and getting there? Because like even getting to to, to twenty four thousand ARR is still still an achievement. Um, and so I'd like I'd like what what advice, what tips would you give to a, a technical founder who's um, you know at that early stage um, and and getting in there to what they should do? Sure. So um, the first thing that I'd like to caveat, and I don't think people do this enough, is that a vast majority of our initial revenue was achieved by cheating. And by yeah. cheating, I mean not not literally fudging the numbers. I, I mean that many of the initial customers um, were in our network or part of Y Combinator, or we were giving a a, a pretty strong discount yeah. um, and, 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 you know, part of another sort of startup accelerator. And uh, on the one hand, uh, you know, you you lose some signal there. I think uh, like the best products you can cold sell and it's just sort of magic and easy. Those are the best products. Um, I do think that uh, the first thing is I would tell technical founders is don't be afraid to cheat. In fact, do it. Yeah. Do it as much as you possibly can. So uh, in ways that are so um, so unnatural. So uh, I will say that like I, um, I, I, it was a very challenging bit to call up 
friends and former colleagues and pitch my product in a sort of awkward way. Um, and it wasn't very natural to me. So I think the first thing is my second piece of advice after cheating is get over it. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, there's a reason why this profession is hard and a skilled one. And, um, and part of it is just overcoming that sort of sense of uneasiness of asking the hard question, like, hey, are you genuinely interested in this? Um, and in the B2B space, we're talking about, you know, while I did make a lot of sales to people that I consider friends, um, they were also very much so customers. Once you start paying me five figures for uh, a product or even six figures for a product, uh, I'm no longer your friend. You are now my boss. Um, right. We might be friendly, but you, you know, you're in charge of me. And um, so, you know, I will say that while we while I was friendly with many of my initial customers, uh, they were kind of, you know, you did have to get over sort of the, the hump of uh, of that. Um, the last and this is the most important one. And I find this to be a problem for me. Um, it's less a problem for Dan. But if you're an extroverted technical founder, um, one of the biggest challenges is all you want to do is talk about how great your product is. Yeah. Um, sometimes people will throw me like a little layup. They'll say, oh, you know, what makes Mozart, you know, better than this? Or what makes Mozart so good? Or how does Mozart help companies? And I can talk for hours about that, about, you know, and, and not in a maybe a, even all that coherent a way. I'll talk about analytics and how I think about analytics and how that philosophy ties into how we built the product. And you can actually see how the philosophy of how I like to do analytics actually fits into how we build kind of um, uh, big elements of our product. Because it, while it is sort of about the customer, there's also sort of a lot of um, Mozart's culture and and pers you know broader personality and philosophy we woven into kind of some of our default settings and some of our um, UI UX. All I want to do is talk about it. And then uh, when we hired somebody for sales, uh, he told me a stat that I that I'll, I'll, I'll you know I don't do a great job of remembering it, but I'm supposed to remember it, which is um, if you're on a sales call and the prospect talks for a majority of the time, that lead is something like I don't know if it's two, three, five, ten x more likely to close than the exact flip. Yeah. So normally what I what my intuition would be is if you ask me what's so great about Mozart, I could talk for hours about it. But in practice, if I want to actually sell you something, I could talk to you briefly about what makes Mozart great, but really deeply understand what is your problem and yeah. see if it actually fits in best to that. And actually just talk through the problem. You know, I'll, I'll sort of add a little bit to that last point, which is um, most of our sales have been consultative. So. Um, you know, there are many ways to solve the problems that Mozart solves. So there's Mozart, there's Mozart competitors, there's the components of Mozart, there's a component of Mozart. So I think that there's a lot of ways to solve sort of analytics problems. We think we're the bestest, bestest, coolest, cheapest, all these things. But at the end of the day, I think customers really deeply appreciate when you're trying to sort of be a teammate um, on their journey. Um, and then if that happens to involve um, using your product because very often, you know, uh, you know, I think our product lines up very closely with the way that I would purport to do analytics. And if you're being honest, the customer will know this, the prospect will know this, that you're actually, this is actually how I would solve this problem. Um, and very often the way that I would solve the problem actually would be to use either Mozart data or tools very much like it. Love it. Um, hiring your first AE, some would say you've gone a little early. Some um, founders like to get as close to the million mark uh, as they can before bringing in someone else. What was your decision making behind hiring an AE much earlier than the norm? Yeah. So I'd gotten 2% of the way there. So uh, so I, I will say, um, yeah, we didn't. <laughs> I, I actually think I think that there are uh, merits to both approaches. Um, I think that there are. I think that there is a lot of wisdom in founder-led sales get all the way to a million, um, because that's probably where you start to see um, replicability. So um, I think one of the worst traps 
that uh, a founder can have is um, say, I need a CRO or I need a CMO. And both of those traps are, uh, you actually need to like a better founder. Yeah. And by the way, like, uh, I, I, you know, I will say uh, a short percent of the journey in, um, I sort of copped out and said, you know, we could really use an AE to to drive processes. And the, and the fact was, this person was just uh, sort of objectively better than I was at at driving a process through and sort of understanding uh I would say sales jargon and uh, and and sales best practices, and um, you know I I think that there's a lot of wisdom in the wait to a million um, because that way you can create the process that that person can then scale up and implement. Whereas if you're doing it, you know, early like we did, um, you probably don't have a repeatable um, you know process that yeah. that might be in a uh, repeatable uh, lead source top of funnel it might be a repeatable motion um, or repeat uh, like a sort of repeatable sort of problem that you're solving so I, I think that there's a lot of wisdom in that and then also founders get so much value out of being on calls um there's something different than just seeing seeing the gong or the video of it there is um there is a real uh, value to being on the call to seeing in the customer's eye in real time you know what they're you know, I think the key is to uh, listen, but also listen to what's not being said. Um, so I do think it's very important that founders stay on the calls. Um, the flip of hiring salespeople early is that you massively accelerate that learning curve. Um, you you have to think of it as more of like a research department, but you have to, um, in the same way that you would manage a product team, in the same way that you would manage an engineering team, you have to be um, an involved participant um, in a revenue team super early on, not to change their behaviors, but actually just to keep learning in the same way that you would um, with any sort of R&D team. You wouldn't be, um, you know, you might be micromanaging some components uh, of the process. Well, actually, you know, you didn't use this data term the way that I might use it or the way that I might think about it. Um, that'll happen. But I think the bigger thing is, um, is just really trying to um, have that team accelerate your learnings and, and set up all of these um, calls. But I think it's important that um, you don't sort of shy away from using these sort of early sales as your as, as just as much as R and D as a product manager, a user researcher, um, a UX a designer, etc. So I would say uh, all of these things have to be true. Love that. Um, one of the one of the there's a lot of difficult things that you need to do when you're when you're building a, a tech startup, but technical founders hiring salespeople is is outside your comfort zone it's normally not something that you've done before um what did you learn from the hiring process of this first a so i i will say that this was another one where we cheated um this was a person that uh i had worked with in the past and uh he was excellent uh at selling a very different product but I think I thought his, a lot of his skills would translate and and they they have. Um, I think as we started to hire uh, other AEs at the company, I think that it is uh, a similar and different skill set. So um, I think just sort of universally uh, with, with everyone, it's a combination of sort of talents and mm -hmm. uh, desire. Um, now, I will say that I think people confuse desire a lot. So, um, you know, it's very easy to understand, you know, who's basically all who's running a marathon at a sprinter's, you know, in a sprinter style and pace. Yeah. I think that that's kind of the wrong way. And again, this is just sort of having limited experience managing a revenue team. Now, I, I, technically I'm not the manager of that team. I'm technically the skip manager of that team, but um, I, I would say, that there is a big component of, you know, run the marathon at the sprinter's pace, but I actually think that's sort of the wrong way of thinking about effort. To me, um, the right way of thinking about effort is, are you really able to uh, exert all the efforts in those key moments that matter the most? Um, I think the, you know, the best salespeople have this, you know, I I, I describe it like, uh, like messy on the, on the pitch. So, yeah. uh, uh, so, 
like Messi looks like the laziest player um, in, in football. Uh, and um, he, he most likely is not. Um, yeah. If you watch him closely, he's, he's pretty much, uh, you know, he, he is rather in some sense sloth like and, 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 and lazy appearing until the moment that is the key moment. And then he's as, frantic and fast and has worked harder than anyone, you know, uh, to, to put himself in the right position. And then, you know, has like incredible, you know, conversion rate, et cetera. And, uh, and it's, it's one of those things where if you were sort of an alien from outer space and you were just watching, if you watched for the wrong minute, you would think of this person as the worst person, you know, on the field. And then, um, and then, if you watch in in the in the right moment, you would of course have the have the much more accurate conclusion. I think the same is very much true um, in sales, yeah. and that's something that I've kind of learned. Love that. Um, so, how did life? You 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 you've got Series A funding um, in place, so you're in a good job. How did life change for you as a founder uh, pre Series A to post Series A? Well, they say life is not supposed to change. It's just, uh, just you know, a few, a few more dollars uh, in the bank account, and you know, having to, uh, you know, hit more ambitious targets. So, uh, you know, the reward for doing well was we had to do even more well. So, um, you know, I, I would say that a great Series A is one where uh, you don't really change what you're doing; you just do more of it. Yeah. Uh, in practice, I don't think that it happens so much. Yeah. So that's the one. That's the one that, like, you know, if if it's really like that, then you're really, uh, then it's a really incredible thing. I think, I think, a, a, a Series A is sort of the the maturation of a seed company, and, and and we were there. So we had, you know, we had, uh, you know, starting to achieve Series A like milestones. So you know, um, hitting, let's say like, like a seven figure ARR number and sort of maturing that company. So taking that company and, you know, adding to it, stacking to it, et cetera. And then we sort of bolted on another sort of seed stage company. Okay. Now we wanted to build Mozart data for the slightly adjacent, um, ICP. Yeah. So, um, I think the, the ideal customer, the ideal, um, process is one where effectively nothing changes just the bank and the scale get get bigger in practice um i think a startup is is more like a series of startups um where you know some of them work some of them don't um and you know just sort of going through that that motion of building many many startups over and over again within sort of one organization with generally the same people um that's kind of the challenge of that transition from seed to A, which is having a mature product and many immature products. Like it, like it. Um, so um, before we hear, uh, uh, and I'm really excited to hear what is next uh, for you guys, we've uh, reached the point in the in the podcast where we get to uh, flip roles and uh, you get the opportunity to ask me that one question that you've always wanted to uh, to ask a recruiter. So don't miss that uh, that chance to uh, to put me on the spot. Uh, hit me up with what you got. Okay, I'm going to ask the most statistician question that you've probably ever been asked. But I I I do I do think about this a lot, and in our recruiting process, we do think about this. In statistics, when you make uh, predictions, there's these steps. There, the, if you think of sort of a two by two matrix, you can you know uh, label something uh you know correctly meaning yes and yes or no and no but actually what's interesting is when you label something in some sense incorrectly and we call these type one and type two errors yeah. so a type one error is where you uh where you basically in in recruiting terms is where you say that a candidate is a good fit but then they end up not being and then a type two error is you pass on a you know a great candidate how yeah. do you think about so my first question is, how do you think about, maybe I'll get one, but how do you think about type one and type two errors? Do you care about eliminating one? Is it more what the client is asking for? Or is it, uh, or is it there's some sort of magic ratio where you say, okay, we can't get everybody right. How do you think about this sort of statistical concept? Yeah. So, so, so what I would say is the first part is that 
uh, type two, you won't get everything right. Um, and don't try to, um, or don't be upset when it doesn't. So what I say is, is that um, what you want is to fail quick. Um, so if it doesn't work out, you want, particularly on sales, um, uh, if it doesn't, if it doesn't work, fail quick, get them out um, and don't keep going with it. And that doesn't necessarily mean that someone's bad. It's just not right. Um, what we get on Taiwan is, is, is what it comes down to is, um, is understanding the detail of what you're looking for. And we often talk to our, um, our clients that you need to understand. So firstly, we look at why are we hiring? Um, so if you're looking for a salesperson, why are you hiring a salesperson? Then you look at what does success look like? Um, and what does failure look like? So we know what failure is. Once we look at what success looks like, we look at, well, what does someone need to be successful um, in that in that role to achieve what you need them to achieve? And we need to look at two things. And this is really important at um, startup level. And, and I'll come on to, it, it works on exactly the sales hire that you made. The person is more important than the experience. OK, nobody is born with the experience of the job that they are doing. OK, it's all learnt um, and it's a capability of learning. What great salespeople have are characteristics and, and each of them are different depending on what the organisation is. So you need to understand what characteristics someone needs to have that stands the best chance of being successful in the role. That's quite easy to do. The challenge is identifying those characteristics in an interview process, because what people tend to do is go off a resume, talk about skill set and experience and decide if they're good or not. And the amount of times where I've, I've seen somewhere where they've been really good in one organization, they go to the next and it doesn't work at all. Are they rubbish? No, they're just in the wrong environment, the wrong place um, for them. So what we do is we, we look at the person and then we layer on top the skill set. Um, and then we weigh the importance of, of what it is. And, and then you do you have an interview process where you know you're asking the right questions and you have people that within the process, and it's harder for really early stage startups, but when you've got two or three people in the process, you trust that one person's looking at the person, one person, uh, so we normally do the person and the professional. So one person looks at the person, one person looks at the professional um, and you mark it up uh, and you have a score sheet uh, on it of what, what you're expecting to. That puts you in the best place where you can say, right, we've really thought about it and we've done this. Um, and um, and then you go, right, we'll make a decision. What I say is, is that if someone gets a score that is a pass, you can still say no. You don't have to put that person through. What you can't do, and this is the challenge, particularly in North America, when someone interviews, you can really like someone, um, but they don't get the score. And it's like, oh, but I like this person, so I might put them through. And it's like, we're not hiring mates. We're not hiring someone to go out for dinner with. We're hiring someone we've already sat down and discussed what they need to hit on. And it doesn't matter if they're a nice person. They haven't got this. So it comes back to having the ratios on both sides. Um, but I put a much more stronger force on the person um, that is um, that is required. And then if there is, so sometimes there will need to be a skill set, but we layer the skill set on top. What you don't do is go, we need the skill set and we go with the skill set over the person. The person comes um, first. Once you do that, you'll have a clearer indication that you're hiring someone that matches um, what you need against what success looks like and what failure looks like. And then you can measure where they need to be um, and how quickly it should take them to get to where they be. And also, does the company have what it takes to enable someone to get to what success looks like? Okay. Um, and then we're good to go. Does that answer your question? That that hit on a lot of the themes. Do I have space for a follow-up question? Yeah, shoot. So you hit on one of my favorite topics. So again, I'm going to sort of talk about my personal background, I'm I'm an economist. Yeah, and uh, one of the um one of the concepts in 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 economics in behavioral economics, which is what I studied, is this concept called the winner's curse. Um, and that concept basically means, uh, people insufficiently sort of, um, understand private signal and how much of it is incorporated into decision making. Yeah, you hit on one of the ones that I hear about the most that I think is the hardest 
one to navigate. So a lot of times I see people successful in, as technologists or more accurately in GTM and sales um, at large companies that are were very successful companies with great product market fit that are that have been killing it. And then they go for another job. And they were able to very successfully leverage, you know, uh, I worked at Microsoft Office, and I'd like to say that all of Microsoft Office's success was due to, uh, you know, it was probably, it was probably, you know, it was probably, uh, it was probably from the decade that I was born, but, uh, but more accurately, uh, you know, I, I, you know, you ask, if you ask my parents, they would probably say it was all me. Yeah. Um, how do you do a good job of understanding whether, you know, a candidate from a successful company um, that's looking to transition into something more early stage that doesn't have any of those sort of um, advantages? Um, mm -hmm. How do you sort of tease that apart? Because generally companies like Microsoft are, are able to hire great people with great benefits and pay. Um, and there are a number of, my colleagues from there who were incredibly talented as technologists, as GTM. Um, and, you know, I, how do you sort of think about sort of that, that, that experience or that sort of experience selling a successful product? Um, so it's a great question. And it, it will quite often, I will, uh, when, particularly when we're hiring for early startups, um, they'll say, I'm not taking anyone from a corporate, they have to have um, startup experience. So they already know what it's like. They've got experience doing it. And then I'll point out that they came from a corporate themselves um, and they're doing a startup um, uh, and, it, and it's working. So, so what it comes down to, there is a, it's a lot. So particularly, and I don't like the phrase an A player, um, um, but a lot of early stage people say, right, I need an A player who's done X, Y, and Z. And then when I say to them, well, you do realize most people who you're classing as A players, you're talking about people who are on president's clubs, they're hitting... Um, their target year in year out okay they look for the easiest route downhill um and do you think someone can come here in year one and do that yeah 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 mm, not really because you're too early stage once you're lateral on you you can you, you know that can happen so so what it then comes down to is that you can hire somebody um from a, a larger organization that has had um you know, all the marketing done for them, um, all the leads put in front of them. But that's where it comes down to um, looking at the characteristics and understanding why someone wants to come and do it. Now, if I'm talking to somebody who um, uh, is at a large corporate uh, and they're like, right, I want to give a startup a go. And you're like, right, why, why do you want to give a startup? I quite fancy getting some equity and seeing where it goes from me. Okay, cool, you're out. Done, right? Because that's not why you join a startup. Um, because let's face it, the chances of that realizing and happening is not there. If it's someone saying that, that you know, their reasons behind it are um, because they want to be part of something that's grow, they want to get in there from the beginning, they've got ideas, um, then you suddenly got uh, a reasons to um, to do it. So it's, it's all around your find capability or what looks like capability. But what you've got to dig into is the reasons um, uh, to it. And also, why, why are you prepared to take a pay cut? um uh to be able to do this because you will be taking um a pay cut um to be able to go in and do that and that's where you start um actually unraveling if this is the right person um and the characteristics of someone who can be um successful in it so don't look at the skill set look at the person um find that out and then um uh look into the skill set after that makes a lot of sense just what i was looking for <laughs> um so look, i really appreciate you taking the uh the time out uh uh Pete, so far before i let you get back to uh your schedule um it would be great to hear uh, what's next for you guys um what does the next 12 18 months look like sure um so mozart is um is rolling we sort of have our niche in the market we serve smbs um, and we provide them a world-class data infrastructure experience. That means ETL, warehousing, um, transformation a second time, and building out that data model. Uh, but I hate describing our product as sort of like in acronyms. In fact, I much prefer thinking about us as the company that makes SMBs successful with their data. And we do basically whatever that takes. So 
Uh, that's kind of how we think about our company. And our goal is just to expand our footprint um, in the SMB market. Uh, we, we mostly serve um, technical operators, so folks that are pretty data savvy, uh, but maybe don't have the data engineering chops to really um, build out a world-class data infrastructure. Um, and we accelerate that. Um, we obviously want to expand sort of our ICP into sort of adjacents, but also I think our biggest thing is, and 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 part of that is, I'm just going to say it, leveraging AI. So it's you know how do you how do you leverage AI to make a bunch of rote processes go faster? And maybe that's things like building um, you know dimension tables, or maybe that's things like um, writing a query when you don't you know know how to you know, basically write SQL, um, but you do know the tables and the business and how it works. So I think that uh, there's a lot of opportunities to expand that way. But ultimately, you know, our our goal is to uh, just get more and more customer wins. So really, uh, because that's sort of that virtuous cycle that feeds it, it sort of informs what we need to build to keep getting those wins and also what we need to build to get those wins even faster. So um you know, hopefully, hopefully a little bit of more of the same and a little bit of new technology and a lot of new customers. And that's kind of on the roadmap for this year. Love that. And does that mean to, to achieve that? Do you need to hire people or do you have the headcount in place um, to achieve it? I'd say both. So I think that, you know, I think one of the beauties of modern technology is that you can uh, scale your business um, in a way that you couldn't when you worked effectively at a factory line. So if you're working on a factory, uh, the output generally is proportional to the number of humans that are working on it. Here, that that scale, we hope, happens on some level uh, exponentially um, or logarithmically, depending on uh, which which way you're talking about it. And, uh, you know, that said, obviously, our sort of ambitions for the company are to to grow at a really you know, strong pace. Love that. Well, look, um, up here, I really enjoyed uh, having the conversations that we've had. I, I, I really appreciate you taking the time out and talking through the the, the journey so far. I think there's some, some really critical points uh, in there that I think the audience will, will take away from. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks again. Thanks for having me.